This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. He is risen. He's... Amen. I love that little video. When I saw that last night, I had to sneak it into the service. We, word spreads so quick these days over news and, and things that are happening that, that um, you can just imagine what it would be like if we had those cell phones, uh, that way to get in touch with our friends and relatives and loved ones. And the news of Easter is so exciting. I want to welcome you here today uh, for all of those of you who are visiting with us today, for those of you online who are joining us there. Uh, happy Easter. It is really, really great to be here. A year ago Easter, a year ago Easter, where were we? Yeah, this is just wonderful. I do want to make mention of the fact that um, if you are feeling um, uncomfortable because of the size of the crowd. This room over here is always set up to be mask only. If you, if you prefer to sit in an area where people are always wearing masks, you can, you can sit in here during the service. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask when the children come up for the children's message that they wear a mask when they come up because we'll be kind of close together. But there's a little bit more room if you want to spread out. You're free to do that. And I just want you to feel very comfortable and very safe. Uh, here as we celebrate the greatest day in the world. Uh, ladies, you have something you'd like to say? Please make sure you introduce yourself, okay? Yep, yep. <laughs> um, good morning and happy Easter. My name's Ashlyn, and we have plenty of Easter breakfast left over. If you'd like to take uh, to go play, <laughs> stop in the fellowship hall. Okay, great. So the, so the uh, confirmation kids have been working this morning with Easter breakfast. They did a great job. And um, they've, uh, they've, got, um, uh, they've been working on building up a little youth fund so that they can enjoy some fun activities. We're going on a retreat next weekend. And um, just, just uh, thank you for the support of our youth ministry. There is extra food, so uh, you can pick up a to-go box after the service. We're following a, a series called Places of the Passion. And throughout Lent, we visited various places, cities and, and um, buildings, different things that play out in the story of Jesus' passion, death, and now today, his resurrection. That series has been taken from the Gospel of Matthew. And so today, we're actually making the last stop uh, to visit the places of the Passion. Of course, it's the garden tomb. John 19 says this, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Please stand and join me for worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us ever walk with Jesus to see the depths of his love. 
to behold the gift of his forgiveness, to gaze upon the heights of his grace, to marvel at the magnitude of his mercy, he travels to the garden soon. And we need not be afraid. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you guide. We continue. Forgive me, O Lord, when my besetting sins entangle me and completely surround me. Forgive me, Lord, when I am so eager to get, but so reluctant to give, so ready to receive your gifts, but so unwilling to bear the cross. Who will rescue me? Forgive me, Father, when I avoid making any commitment to you, when I doubt that you really see my sin, when I disobey your commandments and am satisfied with only living for myself. Who will rescue me from this body? Forgive me, O God, when I am quick to find fault, but resentful when someone points out my faults. When I am so soon at play, but so late in prayer, who will rescue me from this body of death? Father, forgive me when I rejoice in the temporary, but think little of the eternal. When I am so fond of being idle, but show little passion for helpful service, 
Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear the good news. Jesus went to places of rejection, suffering, torment, and death for you. Jesus was determined to go to Gethsemane, Gabbatha, and Golgotha for you. And Jesus lives for you. That's why Jesus forgives you completely and loves you eternally. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you guide. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God and Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of our Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading comes from the book of Job, chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. Oh, that my words could be recorded. Oh, that they could be inscribed on a monument, carved with an iron chisel, and filled with lead engraved forever in the rock. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 15 to 18. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, We are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for our gospel lesson. From Matthew 28, verses 1 to 11. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said it would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, 
and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priest what had happened. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Okay, kids, if you want to put your mask on and come up here, I've got a little message I'd like to share with you today. Come on up if you'd like. Ah. Wow. Good to see all you guys. Hello. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Eli. Hi, guys. Oh, good. Here come a bunch of friends. Well, I want to tell you a story. Are you ready? There was once a little gray mouse. And the little gray mouse was um was very afraid he was afraid of the cat he was terrified of the cat like a mouse might be you know ah cat till the one day when the little gray mouse met a magician and the magician said what's what's wrong with you little gray mouse he goes i'm afraid of the cat i'm afraid of the cat so you know what he did he turned the mouse into a cat took care of the fear. He wasn't afraid anymore, right? But then, what do you suppose came along? The cat. Nope. The mouse. Nope. A dog. You know what happened to the cat? It got up a tree. The, the cat was afraid of the dog. And so the cat ran up to the magician and said, I'm afraid of the dog, I'm afraid of the dog. And so you know what the magician did? Turned him into a dog. Yeah, right. You're starting to get onto the story real quick. He turned the, turned the cat into a dog. So the mouse, the mouse became the cat. The cat became the dog. The dog wasn't afraid anymore. And then guess what? A bull came along. A bull? No. <laughs> Not in my a story. Lion. In my story, it's a lion. That's right. Along comes a lion. <laughs> You know, fierce, fierce lion. And then the magician turned the lion into a cat, or into a lion. <laughs> and then a cheetah came along. Okay. <laughs> He's so way ahead of me. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Okay, so, so the dog was afraid of the lion. Oh, I'm so afraid of the lion. I'm so afraid of the lion. The magician said, poof. Turned the mouse to the cat, the cat, to the dog, the dog into a lion. lion. That's right. The lion was not afraid anymore. But then along came... A cheetah. No, not a cheetah. A giraffe. No, not a giraffe. A giraffe. No. A rhino. No, a hunter. A hunter. And then... See, let me tell the story, guys. What? Are you ah. So, 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 the lion was terrified of the hunter. Went to the magician, and you know what the magician said? I know. He says, I could turn you into a hunter, but you still have the heart of a mouse. You know what that means? It meant that, it meant that he was afraid when he was little, and even as he got bigger, he was still afraid, sometimes. Today, at Easter, we heard Jesus telling his disciples, don't be afraid, I'm going ahead of you into Galilee. 
So he was telling the disciples, don't be afraid. And yet, sometimes people are still afraid, even when we get big and grown up. I know, if you look out and see all those grown up people out there, all of the grown up people out there have something they're afraid of. I know what it is. You know what it is? <laughs> a cheetah, that's right. They're all afraid of cheetahs. <laughs> Huh. Yeah, I'm going to give you the pulpit today, kiddo. He just, he, I don't know if you caught that. He says, they're afraid of faith in God. <laughs> he just about stole the sermon for today. <laughs> so we better quit while we're ahead. <laughs> but yes, we, we, all have, we all have fears. We have fears about the, the things that we see, the things that we hear, the things that we experience. But God... God wants us to know that Jesus has died on the cross and rose again so that we don't have to fear. And we can be a little gray mouse, or we can be a cat, or we can be a dog. We can be anything and let the Lord give us encouragement and strength to not be afraid. I know what they're scared of. You know I know what they're scared yeah, that, I'd say they're, they're scared of prison. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, we can come up with a hundred things that the grown-ups are afraid of, but, afraid of God. but we are going to learn that faith, faith in God helps us with the things we're afraid of, okay? Can you, can you pray with me? Hold your hands, okay? And you say this with me. Dear God, thank you for giving us Jesus. Please build our faith so we don't have to be afraid. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, head on back to your seats. And please, please... Uh, Everyone else stand and join me in singing this next song called Living Hope. It's a contemporary song.
may be seated. I love that song. It's just a couple of years old. Um, but I love how it speaks about the cross, the finished work of Jesus, and the declaration that's made on our life because of what Jesus offered us on the cross. He took our sins on himself, faced the awful penalty and punishment in our place, and declared us free. Rising from the dead, he made it certain for us. Matthew 28, verse 4 says, And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Matthew 28, 5 says, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. Verse 8, So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Matthew 28, 10. Easter is supposed to be a time of great joy, light and brilliance, loud praises and hallelujahs, celebration and flowers, but, but Easter begins with fear. Fear that the disciples really experienced. Great fear. I've got a working definition that we'll use for fear today. It's false evidence appearing real. Have you ever run into fear that way? Something that seems so real, looks fearful, sounds fearful, everybody else is saying it's fearful, and so we buy into that evidence to what appears very real and very frightening. Well, on that first Easter, it makes sense that the evidence the disciples were looking at was overwhelmingly fearful. Jesus was utterly, barbarically, brutally maimed and mercilessly nailed to a cross. He bled and died. A spear pierced his side. He was haphazardly buried in a tomb. His ministry, done. That's what appeared so real. The experience of it. All hope was lost. When Jesus said, it is finished, they didn't hear or understand the deeper understanding that his salvation was finished. It was accomplished in the cross. They thought he was finished for good. Easter begins with great fear. False evidence appearing so very real. Well, the goal of my message today is to replace fear with faith. And here's what I want to think about here. Faith. Forsaking all, I take him. See, that, that's the replacement for fear. Remember that. Jesus creates beauty from ashes. Jesus redeems, restores, renews. Forsaking all, I take him. Is the message I want to drive home today. But fear really nails us. As much as we try to deny it or hide it or fake it, there is fear. And we can live in false fear, even as grown-ups. That was so insightful. <laughs> They're afraid of faith in God. No truer words can be spoken for so many people. It's kind of like when we took the kids camping at Inks Lake in Texas. We had this annual tradition of camping there with a bunch of friends, and one of the things we liked to do was take a nighttime hike. 
up into the rocks and trails at Inks Lake. It's in the Texas Hill Country, so there are some critters up there. And, um, and uh, those of us who grew up in the northern part of the country realize that some of those critters are scary dangerous, right? We don't often think that those scary creatures are slithered away into quiet crags in the rocks further away than the trail. But you know, we, we'd, we'd go hiking at night and no one was allowed to bring a flashlight except for the person who was leading and he kept it off unless there was an emergency. Wow. Wow. Do you know how noisy armadillos are? Holy cow. They rustle through the leaves and when you're in the pitch dark and you're walking and all of a sudden along the trail you hear those sounds, you are certain that you are about to face a Yeti, Bigfoot. You know, that's, and, and when you've got a whole, bunch of, a whole bunch of little kids traipsing behind you and someone goes, oh, what's that? Listen. And then the leader says, I think it's Bigfoot. <laughs> That's what happens. We, 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 we get the evidence that something is alongside the trail, like right there. And it turns out the evidence appeared very real for something our mind had made up. Fear whispers incessantly. Oh, it's on us all the time. There's trouble out there. And we feel it, we sense it, because of all that whispering of, of the trouble. And when others don't seem to have that fear, we wonder, what's wrong with them? Haven't they been hearing the news? Are they so naive to think that there's no trouble out there? Airplanes fall out of the sky, bull markets go bare, terrorists terrorized, good people turn bad. What's with them? Fear attacks us with words, two words in particular. What if? What if I don't close the sale? What if I don't get the bonus? What if she doesn't love me? What if my kids have crooked teeth? And what if they don't have any friends because they've got crooked teeth? They don't get a career because they've got crooked teeth. They don't get married. They got crooked teeth and they wind up sitting on a street corner with a sign that says, my parents didn't fix my crooked teeth. We, we, we worry here about so many things. Fear twists us into emotional pretzels. Our heads ache, we sweat, we're numb with fear. We binge on TV, snack food, alcohol, whatever it is to, to numb the fear that we have. Sometimes we express our fear with volcanic anger, silent stares. Boy, we're experts at both. But help is on the way. There is an altarpiece in France called the... Um, Ensenheim altarpiece. This sits behind the altar. It's actually very tall. It's like 14 feet tall. It's just huge. And um, it was created for a monastery there in that town where they cared for people with skin diseases. Most particularly, they had what was called ergotism or was sometimes called ergotoxicosis, ergo poisoning, or St. Anthony's fire. It was a skin disease. It left terrible sores and discolored the skin. And that's the important part in this altarpiece because the, the painter who painted this, knowing that the patients, the, the doctors, and the family members would come to this chapel and see this crucifix, he painted Jesus in this with a skin disease. His skin is discolored. 
He's got sores all over his body, not from whip marks, but just sores and thorns from his crown stuck in his... It's, it's a horrible uh, picture. But the painting shows that Jesus understands and sympathizes with the fears and with the sufferings of his people. He gets it. And it's said that for, for decades and decades, this painting was a special comfort to the patients who could look at Jesus and say, wow, how he suffers, how he knows, how he understands. They were afraid of those skin diseases. What is it for you? They were afraid the skin diseases could kill them. What is it that, that you feel can kill you? The anxiety, the fear, the loneliness, cancer, taxes, depression, debt, divorce, teenagers, dementia. We can just go through a list of things and understand that Jesus understands what we're going through. Mary, the mother of Jesus, knows all about fear. In the altarpiece, she is collapsing into the arms of John, the, the apostle. John the Baptist also appears in the altarpiece. He's, he's uh, there by the lamb. He's holding a lamb. No, he's holding a Bible right by the lamb. And he's pointing to Jesus. Now, John the Baptist was already executed. He couldn't have been at the, at the crucifixion. But he's symbolizing the fact that here is the sacrifice. Here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There's another important point. What looks world-ending what looks tragic and final in this picture is actually life-giving. Jesus is painted in this with that diseased skin. His lips are ashen and blue. It's clear that he is dead in this picture. But this altarpiece looks like this most of the time, but it, it's actually got three layers. And on Easter, they open the doors of this altarpiece, and it reveals an Easter scene. The outer wings uh, that, that are opened on Easter and Christmas uh, show that Christ is bursting forth from the tomb. He's risen. Death has no more dominion over him. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And in this painting, Jesus' hands are raised in blessing. Behind him, the sun is in the sky, swirls of, of yellow, white, and red. And then those, those beautiful, victorious garments clothing Christ. Wow, really super. But here's the thing. <laughs> if you get up close, and I can't, I can't uh, find a picture that gets up close enough to show it, but if you get up close to Jesus, this amazing picture where Jesus' wounds are red, the artist has painted rubies. Rubies where the wounds were. Rubies for the scars. Christ, our Redeemer, creates beauty from ashes, rubies from scars. Christ's rejection and desertion and finally rubies. Flogging and mocking, finally rubies. Nails and spear, finally rubies. Death, sin, the struggle, the victory is won. And what looks world-ending 
is life-giving because Jesus lives. And Jesus said it would happen. Five times in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says that he would rise from the dead. Five times he says, I must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things and be killed, and on the third day, rise from the dead. Five times Jesus says that, and still the disciples chose fear over faith. They abandoned Jesus on Thursday. Only one of his 12 disciples stands at the cross on Good Friday. And on Sunday, they're all hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. It's so easy to choose fear over faith. False evidence appearing real. Just ask Grisha Siklenko. Just ask him. In 1960, an amazing thing happened in a tiny village in the Ukraine. Grisha Siklenko appeared one day, much to the shock of his friends and neighbors. Everyone thought that Grisha had died in World War II. And in 1960, he shows up. You see, what actually happened, the night he marched away to war, he doubled back, went home, and his mother made a hiding place for him under a manure pile. And so for 18 years, Grisha lived in manure. In the winter, he nearly froze to death. In the summer, he nearly suffocated. Finally, in 1960, Grisha walked out of the manure expecting to be persecuted and punished and placed in prison. His fears were all unfounded and groundless. The statute of limitations had long since gone. But see, fear does that. We end up living in a manure pile of our own construction. And then life really stinks. It really, really stinks. How smart is that? Wouldn't you rather live by faith? Then here is the angel's promise for you. He is not here. For he has risen just as he said. Just as as he said. We can trust what Jesus says. When he tells us something is going to happen, it happens. We can trust Jesus when he says, your sins are taken away. You can trust Jesus when he says, death is conquered. You can trust Jesus when he says, I am alive. And I am returning one day. You can trust what Jesus says. Do you know the most frequent command in the Bible? Repeated by prophets, by angels, by Jesus and the apostles. What do you think it would be? Be good? Be holy? Don't sleep during the message of of the church sermon. Don't sleep. (laughs) No, the most frequent command in the Bible is do not fear. The number one. I remember preaching that probably in the first couple weeks I was here at Bethlehem. Oh, Bethlehem. Do not fear. Faith is forsaking all I take him. Our Redeemer, our Lord, Jesus who creates life out of death, beauty from ashes. Remember remember the wounds as rubies. Now that's not what happened. Jesus didn't all of a sudden grow rubies out of his This was just an artist saying, there's beauty here. There's beauty here. 
So I don't know what it is that makes you fearful. You have small children, do not fear. If you have teenagers, do not fear. Has everything gone terribly wrong? Do not fear. Are you sick? Do not fear. Let these six words go down into the deepest, insidest, most part of your soul. What Job said in our first lesson, I know that my Redeemer lives. Forsaking all, I take him and live. And live. Gracious God, be with us now as we ponder the victory of your Son again and again. In his precious name, amen. Would you please stand and join me for prayers? Onward in Christ's footsteps treading, pilgrims here, our home above, full of faith and hope and love. Let us do the Father's bidding, and so we pray, living Lord Jesus. On the first day of the week, you rolled away the stone from the tomb and opened up life for all who believe. Roll away the stones of fear in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Living Lord Jesus, replace our fear with bold faith, a faith that looks at challenges, pain, setbacks, and heartaches, and gives it all to you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Living Lord Jesus, release us from the prisons of fear that we might be free. Set free all who live in bondage to anxiety, chained to addiction, and enslaved to evil. Lord, in your mercy. Living Lord Jesus, you set your table before us in the remembrance of Passover fulfilled and in the anticipation of the future prepared for us. Give us faith that we may receive this holy communion for our benefit and show forth love for you and for all people. Lord, in your mercy. Living Lord Jesus, you address the sick and the suffering with your grace to heal, relieve, and restore. Give to all the sick, the wounded, the grieving, and the dying the full measure of your healing grace to support them. We especially pray for Carolyn, Dolores, Claire, Harlan, Randy, Mike, and Faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living Lord Jesus, you bid us to go forth confidently with Easter faith and a deathless and endless hallelujah. We will do just that in the power of your Holy Spirit and as a witness to the world. Jesus, let me faithful be. Life eternal grant to me. Amen. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Please be seated. At this time, um, we're going to celebrate communion. And uh, since COVID has happened, we've gone to these little individual packs. So if you're visiting with us, please pay close attention to what I'm about to say. If you don't have a communion pack, we have some extras. Just raise your hand and we'll make sure someone gets one for you. Okay, don't be shy. If you don't have one, uh, that's fine. Now, um, okay, we need, we need one up here. Any more? 
anymore? Okay. All right, it's coming up here to, to the front. So um, the way this works is um, don't, don't take the communion yet. <laughs> okay. I've got some very eager confirmands. Um, so what you're going to do is when, when we've done the teaching and, and done the consecration, just follow me what I do, okay? We're going to uh, take the little packet, and there's, there's a cellophane layer that peels off the top, and that's when you take the wafer, the bread, okay? And then there's the foil piece comes off over the cup so that you can drink from the cup, okay? So you can take it out of the bag right now and just hold it, just hold it. I'd like to talk a little bit about this amazing, Thing. So, I mentioned in the message that we can trust what Jesus says. And I think that's especially important when we come to a time like Holy Communion. A couple of weeks ago, uh, in confirmation class, well, it was just this last week, we talked about how Jesus uses specific words at a specific time with a specific intent. He realizes that he's about to be betrayed and abandoned by his disciples, and he takes bread and a cup of wine, and in the context of a meal that spells victory and, and um, redemption and forgiveness and grace, he, t- he talks about how his body and blood are present in the bread and wine. Now, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. And so, as I said in today's message, we can trust that what Jesus says is what Jesus means. And so, on Easter especially, this Lord's Supper becomes for us a feast of victory. It's because Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. And we are present with him and he with us. It's an amazing gift of assurance. That's why we teach in this church the real presence of Christ in, with, and under the bread and wine. Hear these words from the scripture. On the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. O Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us and grant us peace. Amen. You may now take communion. Please reseal the bag around the used cup and uh, just leave it in your pew. We'll come by and clean them up. Just make sure it's sealed so it doesn't um, make a mess. Now I know, I know that I know what Jesus said is very true. 
He said, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And he urged us to go and make disciples. He promised he would be with us in word and in sacrament. And he is. He's promised that we are forgiven and we are. Let's let that sink in today to make our Easter celebration one of life and joy and freedom. We continue with the benediction. Jesus invites us to walk with him to the garden tomb, a place of great joy and a place of great love. We will walk with Jesus all our days to the empty tomb and resurrection victory. Let us ever walk with Jesus. Let's stand and blow the dust off the rafters with the closing song, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. We got enough people in here, I think we can shake a few cobwebs loose. Let's stand and sing. We've been doing something completely different with the offering. We didn't take an offering during church. There's an offering box by the door. You can leave an offering there if you brought one with you. Don't feel obligated uh, if you're visiting with us. Uh, just another quick mention, too, and that is our um, heating and air conditioning uh, fund. Uh, we are $1,445 from reaching the goal for phase one, and the the uh, unit is coming tomorrow, is that right? Yeah, got good weather, so they're going to put in the boiler tomorrow. And um, I was saying to a few people, I bet you we pay the bill tonight or today. So, yep. No Sunday school today, but we're back in session next week. Okay, no Sunday school today, back in session next week. Please remember there's extra uh, Easter breakfast food. You can pick it up if you'd like to. Have a blessed Easter, everyone. Take care.